All right, thank you very much to Ruslan and Jelastic for bringing me here. Um, can I have my clicker? Doesn't work? Okay, you guys will have to control it. All right, so the slides are online. I'm quite used to having my laptop and directing my own presentation, but we'll have to see if these guys can figure it out. Um, how do I indicate next slide? Do I, do I jump? Do I <laughs> sing? <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> What's next slide in Ukrainian? Okay, here we go. Um, so I started this stuff way back in 1993. I was writing lots and lots of code that looked like this. So CGI programs written in C, and it was very, very tedious. I don't expect you to read this. This, this is HTML embedded inside the CGI C program. Lots of people then moved on to Perl. Next slide. <laughs> so lots of people moved on to this. This is much prettier, much easier to deal with. But again, it didn't fit the way I wanted to build web applications. I didn't want to do the design part. I didn't want to do the front end work. Even that many years ago, I wasn't that interested in making things look pretty. I was more interested in making stuff fast on the back end. And this combined the HTML and design with the code, and I didn't want that. I wanted that. So I wanted HTML templates with a little bit of templating. Um, but basically, I wanted to be able to explain to the designer, look, here are some magic tags. Just like HTML tags, here are some other tags you can put in. If you want to pull a record from the database, for example, just put in this one little magical tag. And I wrote all the business logic in C on the back end, and I just exposed that business logic via these tags. And that was the original intent of PHP. It was supposed to be a way of exposing business logic written in C or C++ to the front end via this templating language. It wasn't supposed to be a language on its own. It was supposed to just be a, an interface or a gateway to the business logic that was written in a strongly typed compiled language. But the web grew so fast, and there were not enough C developers in the world, that everyone just started using the templating system entirely to write all their business logic which wasn't really what I had in mind <laughs> behind PHP, but that's kind of what happened. So um, I changed gears a bit and said, okay, nobody wants to use PHP the way I want to use PHP, but let's then try to at least build something that works well for people. And I focused a lot on the ecosystem and on the problem itself. What, what are the obstacles for people to putting things on the web back in the mid-90s. And back then, everyone was hosting things on shared servers, basically. So they found an ISP that would host things for them. And I made sure that PHP worked well on ISPs so that an ISP could confidently put PHP on their servers, and they had time limits and memory limits and things like that to make sure that one customer couldn't completely destroy the experience of another customer on the same server. And PHP was really the only solution back then that an ISP could put on a server and then split that server up into like a thousand shared virtual hosts and put lots and lots of users on the same host. So it was very cost effective for an ISP to provide PHP versus other technologies. You couldn't provide Java to a thousand users on one machine. It just wasn't possible. Mod Perl came along later on, which was way too powerful. You couldn't provide Mod Perl access to users because Mod Perl had really deep integration into the Apache web server. So one user could completely change how the web server worked. So everyone would have to have their own Apache instance for Mod Perl. So that wasn't cost effective either. So the fact that PHP fit in well into this ecosystem really caused PHP to grow and grow quickly. Um, so along the way, we had to make some concessions here and there. Um, there are lots of things that people criticize PHP about, and most of them actually had a pretty good reason for being the way they were. Like the first thing there, case and sense of the function names. That was because in 1993, 94, 95, 
people weren't sure if they should be using HTML tags that are uppercase or lowercase. Many, many people were using all uppercase HTML tags, but there was a bit of a religious war where now lowercase has won. Everyone uses lowercase. But in the mid-90s, half the people in the world used uppercase. And I didn't want to be part of this war. I wanted to basically say, look, these are just tags, just like HTML tags. You, they can be upper or lowercase, doesn't matter. Whatever your religion is, use it the way you want. And that was the reason for it. And now, fast forward 20 years, and suddenly it's kind of silly that function names are not case sensitive, but nowhere along the way did it feel right to switch it because it would break a whole bunch of code for no real substantial reason. And hold on, hold on, don't. Um, um, so other things, naming inconsistencies is another thing that PHP gets a lot of criticisms about. Basically, these are all due to the fact that PHP is just a very thin layer on top of underlying libraries. And all the naming and argument orders and things come from the underlying libraries that we talk to. Very few of them are just PHP. Like simple string functions tend to come out of libc, for example, and they take the argument order that libc uses. Um, and it's not as inconsistent as people think, like the needle haystack stuff. If you actually look through the functions, you'll see that all array functions are needle haystack. All string functions are, are haystack needle. Consistently, so it's not, it's not super inconsistent, it's just that people, when they look at the array function, they look at the string functions, they see it flipped and they kind of go crazy. <laughs> and it's really not that big a deal. Most people use an IDE these days that fill it out anyway, and we have really good documentation that helps you through it. But it's one of the favorite things that people like to complain about. All right. Next slide. So, um, like I said, I focused a lot on the ecosystem around PHP and not very much on the language itself. Um, the idea was to build an end-to-end -end solution that could simply solve the problem and not worry too much about perfection. I mean, if you worry about perfection all the time, you will never finish anything. You'll never get anything out there. And one of the things about PHP, it's a very pragmatic, let's just get this done, get it working, it has to be fast, has to be robust, can't crash all the time, um, and it has to be secure. And most of those things we achieved pretty well. Um, so for performance and robustness, the fact that PHP uses a shared nothing architecture gives you a very nice um, scalability profile, meaning that your application can scale horizontally infinitely because every request is distinct and discrete. There's nothing stored in any sort of application server. There are no application variables like in ASP. There's nothing you can store in the JVM like in Java. There is no application server. So if your application doesn't scale, it's completely your fault. It's not my fault. Because anything that doesn't scale is stuff that you have written. PHP itself intrinsically scales infinitely. And it was a way of being lazy for me as well. I mean, I just pushed the problem to other people, basically. And, I mean, and but that's the right way of doing it. It's the, the Unix way, small tools that do a job well. Don't try to do every job in one tool. It's not going to work. There are companies out there that spend their entire lifetime worrying about scalability. If you want a scalable data store, well, use a scalable database, an Oracle or MySQL or Postgres, one of those. Those guys are sitting there worrying, nothing, worrying about nothing else but that particular problem. So putting some kind of weird mini database into PHP as an application server would be completely wrong. Um, some other things. I came up with this limit clause for SQL because I was working with a database that didn't have cursors or anything like that. And if I, by mistake, did a select and got too many rows back, it would take a long time to transfer them over the wire to get to my application. And my web interface was frozen. So I hacked up the database and added the limit clause. And you guys have probably all used the limit clause now in MySQL and in Postgres. There's a few other databases now. But that proved one of these very pragmatic, very useful features that 
came out of the PHP project basically and has now infected databases all over the place. So anytime you see the limit clause, that's kind of a little piece of PHP that has leaked into databases, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and I talked a bit about security, uh, sorry, the max execution time, memory limits, things like that, to make ISPs feel better about using PHP and feel confident that they could run it in a shared environment. All right, keep going. Now we're in the present. How many people in here are running a version of PHP less than 5.3? So 5.1, 5.2, okay, wow. That's really depressing. <laughs> <laughs> you guys shouldn't even be in the room. You should be at home upgrading your crap. Because <laughs> this stuff is so old. I mean, 5.3, I can understand, I can tolerate it, that's okay. Anything older than 5.3, no way. But even the people on 5.3 in the room, you need to get on 5.4. And here's why. We have made a whole bunch of performance improvements in 5.4. There's a list here, a um, bunch of things like empty hashes. You can initialize an empty hash much quicker in 5.4. So anytime you see, I just saw in the E presentation, there was a dollar $config equals array, bracket, bracket, right? That's an empty hash initialization, which we've sped up quite a bit in 5.4. Um, the silence operator is quick now. It used to be super, super slow. Not that you want to use it too much, but if you do use it, your app will go faster. So there's a whole bunch of things we've sped up quite a bit in 5.4. There's a built-in web server. Please don't use it as a production web server, but it's really cool for testing and development. And I think IDEs will start using it and integrating it as well. It's cool that you can fire up the web server in a directory, and that directory becomes your document root. You can just you can run an entire framework directly from the command line um, and test things out locally, which I think is cool, without having to worry about configuring a web server, anything like that. Um, one of the big new features in 5.4 are traits, right? horizontal code reuse. Instead of having to always rely on inheritance or vertical code reuse, there are some times when things just aren't related. They shouldn't inherit from each other just to reuse code. So with a trait, you could simply define a trait and then you can use that trait in a class. So you can write the code once and then stick it in like a logging method, for example. You might want the logging method in all of your objects, but that doesn't mean your objects should be related. You can just use logging, basically, and have that logging method show up in all your objects. Scroll. Scroll. <laughs> um, Short the array syntax. You can now use just square brackets. You don't need to use the array keyword anymore. Um, function array dereferencing, right? If a function returns an array, right on the function call, you can dereference it. So the fruits function there returns an array. You put fruits, square bracket zero, you get the first element directly from that. Um, dollar this in the current scope inside the closure is handled a little bit, well, we're actually handled now. We didn't handle it in 5.3. So if you define a closure inside a method in the class, the dollar this, anything you have access to at the point of the closure definition, you will have access to at execution time or at call time. So wherever you call that closure from, even if you call the closure from outside the class, dollar this is available to the closure and can then access private properties. If you don't want it to be able to access private properties, you can define it as a static closure. But, I mean, you're in full control, so if you don't want it to look at private properties, don't code it that way. Um, so basically, that wasn't available before in 5.3. Um, the short echo syntax, so question mark equals syntax, is now always available. It's not connected to short tags anymore. I know there are lots of frameworks that have templating that use the short echo syntax. Now you don't need to force short tags on, which is very handy. Um, there's a new session object, um, callable type hint, and a bunch of other things. There's a JSON interface. So if you implement this interface in your object, and if someone tries to JSON encode your object, you can now control how that's going to be JSONified. Um, which can be handy. 
MySQL ND is everywhere now. Um, you can still compile against libmysql client if you want, but we, by default, use MySQL ND, and ND is the native driver, which is a MySQL client library specifically written for PHP, uses the PHP memory manager, which means we probably use about half the memory because we don't no longer have to malloc in the client library and then move things over into PHP's memory manager. We can now just allocate it once using the PHP memory manager and manipulate it from there. So it's much more efficient and it has cool features such as asynchronous MySQL queries, um, which means you can fire off queries, lots of them to MySQL, and then go do other things and then reap the results when you need them later on, which makes for a little bit better um, if you have lots of queries, it can speed up your pages quite a bit. What else? Then a bunch of minor features that aren't very important. Um, and it works with Apache 2.4 on Windows now, in case any of you guys are on Windows. I hope not. All right, so here is PHP 5.4 with a new opcode cache we're using called opcache versus PHP 5.3 plus APC. The green and the blue yellow are two servers running 5.3, the blue and the red are two servers running 5.4. And basically the first one is user CPU. So these are requests on etsy.com, which is where I work. And you can see that user CPU dropped by about 15%. Next one is system CPU, so uses less system CPU as well for the same number of requests, dropped by 12, 13%. Um, we have memory usage has dropped as well. You can see it goes from about 24 megs per request down to 19. So we're, we're using less system resources, we're using less memory. And the very important part is the bottom graph, which is the PERC95 response time or the latency. So it's the, the time from the request hitting the server to the first byte being returned. And that has dropped from, if you scroll down a little bit, can we see the bottom? No? Okay, we lost it. Um, but anyway, that has also dropped by about 14% on average across all of Etsy's requests simply by doing the upgrade from 5.3 to 5.4. No code changes whatsoever. So for those of you who are still on 5.3, it's not that much effort. You still have to test, of course, you have to go through that, but you do have some real gains from going to 5.4. You can expect to see 10 to 15% performance gains across the board once you do this upgrade, which is cool. Next slide. So, things that might bite you though. There are a few things, we have now switched to UTF-8 everywhere in, in PHP, um, or at least for various functions that deal with character sets. The default character set is now always UTF-8, whereas before it was ISO 8859-1, which you guys in Ukraine probably weren't using anyway, so you should be fine on, on this particular point. Um, there's a new notice. If you try to echo out an array, you're gonna get an array to string conversion notice. You probably all experienced seeing the word array in your web page because you tried to print something out that was actually an array. Now you have a notice and you can deal with that better. Remove register globals, magic quotes, variable break continues are gone, nobody used them. Um, max input vars is interesting. A while ago, there was a, it was very fashionable to d do a DDoS or a denial of service attack against servers by crafting requests such that you deliberately did a hash collision. Every language uses hashes for things. But if you craft the keys for a hash such that they all hash to the same bucket, most hashing algorithms end up using a, a linked list at that point. So if you have two things that hash to the same bucket, you say, okay, I already have one thing there, I'll just do a link to the next one. Now, if everything hashes to the same bucket, you end up with a lot of links um, inside that bucket. So if you have a million items that end up in the same bucket, to add, to get to the millionth and first, once you add one more, you have to go through a million links. And that takes a bit of time and that can really slow down the server. So we had to add this max input vars. Basically says, well, if you have more than a thousand post form fields, we're gonna truncate it at that point. So if you do have an application that has more than a thousand form fields, you're gonna have to increase this value when you upgrade to 
hopefully you don't have a form with a thousand fields. It would take a user a long time to fill out this form and they'd probably get bored long before they finished. But there are cases, and it's not really in the, in the user interactive way. There are cases with APIs, for example, um, PayPal's instant payment notification. If you have a big shopping cart, um, the instant payment notification when they pay can end up sending more than a thousand fields. So if you have an, something like that with lots and lots of fields you, and it doesn't work when you upgrade to 5.4, this is probably the thing you need to tweak a little bit and raise it. We thought a thousand was way higher than anybody would need, but we hadn't thought of things like PayPal being creative. <coughs> um, a couple of other things in there that really edge cases. Uh, MySQL list DBs was a MySQL function that was available before. It's no longer available. You can do it directly with a query itself. So there's a few edge cases that might trip you up, but for the most part, <clears throat> nothing here should be a big stumbling block for doing the upgrade. Next slide. So, <clears throat> but why stop at 5.4? Let's go straight to 5.5 since that is now stable and robust it's out there. We have a few language level performance improvement. If you have lots of recursion, um, nested calls are handled quite a bit better in 5.5. So any sort of recursive algorithms are gonna work better in 5.5 than in 5.4. But the big performance thing we did in 5.5 was we bundled an opcode cache. So send, send optimizer plus is the basis of it. It's been changed a bit since it was Zend. Um, <clears throat> but now that's the default opcode cache that ships with PHP now. Instead of having five or six different ones out there, all in various states of brokenness, we now have basically joined all our resources into a single project that will now be released with PHP. So as soon as the new version of PHP comes out, there's going to be a stable, robust opcode cache that just works. Um, and that's gonna be a big deal for a lot of people that were, especially people who were confused by opcode caches and couldn't figure out which one to use. Now there's one that's always gonna be working and if you haven't been using an opcode cache before, you're gonna see a massive performance increase by going to 5.5 with the bundled opcode cache. <clears throat> um, language level, the big new feature in 5.5 are generators. So a generator is basically a way of calling a function and returning one element at a time while keeping the state that you're in. So in this example here, I have this X range function, right? Every time I call it, it returns the next value in the range that I asked for. So from the start to the end range. And the, the magic there is the yield keyword. So you can yield a value when you want to return the next thing. <clears throat> Without a generator, you might write something like this to simply return an array. You create a big array and you return the array of all the numbers from start to end. But that means you have this big array in memory. And if it's a million elements, that can be a lot of memory and a lot of time. This way, you never have to have a million elements in memory. You can simply yield the next value each time without building it all once. Or you could do it via a static variable, obviously. So you can do a static variable and write it differently. <clears throat> but then, you end up having to write the code quite differently. It's much easier just taking the normal loop that you would do otherwise and just doing a yield when you want the next value. <coughs> Finally, um, so if you have some code in an object that you always want to run, not necessarily in an object, sorry, um, in a try catch block, if you have some cleanup code that always needs to run, whether or not an exception happened, you can stick that cleanup code in the finally block and that will get executed no matter what happened in the try. Um, you can use a list and for each. You can basically do the first level of dereferencing for your array at the for each stage. You can speed things up a little bit. Constant and array, constant string and constant array dereferencing. So if you have a constant string, you can pick out the character directly from it. I don't quite see how this is useful, but we had some people asking for it and it's a consistency thing, really. Why can't you do a dereference, a, a constant string? So now you can. Uh, empty can now run on expressions and return values from functions. Before, you could only call empty on an actual variable to see if that variable would empty. Now you can do it on expressions. Curl upload functionality was really broken. 
It, it worked, but it was really flaky with the way you had to use an ampersand to specify the file to upload. It's been completely rewritten in 5.5 and works much, much better and cleaner. And finally, the simplified hashing API. One of the things we have found or that everyone has seen is that people get their password storage completely wrong. You always read about sites being hacked and their database, their password database stolen. And then either the passwords were not encrypted at all, not hashed, or they were hashed really badly without assault. So you can simply run a, ra a rainbow table against it and get 90% of the passwords. So the password hashing function basically just picks sane defaults, picks the sane hashing algorithm, makes sure there's assault, and just does it right for people who don't understand anything about cryptography. Um, this is one of the things that PHP has always tried to do over the years. It takes something that's actually quite complicated and make it really, really simple so any idiot will get it mostly right. Um, and, and that's important. Nobody can be an expert on everything. There, there are people who are super, super smart but don't know anything about a password hash and that shouldn't work against them. It really shouldn't. <clears throat> so, I know I'm short on time. So, if you're running less than 5.3, go home and upgrade right now. If you're running 5.3, upgrade tomorrow. <laughs> uh, preferably to PHP 5.5, um, just to get all the performance increases that you can. There's a whole bunch of guides to help you with that upgrade. So, on the php.net site, you can pick the correct guide, the 5.2 to 5.3, 5.3 to 5.4. Um, we don't have a 5.2 to 5.5, so you might have to read all the guides in between to make sure you catch everything. Um, and the slides are online there if you want to go and check any of this stuff. So I think we have a little bit of time for questions, right? I tried to go fast to get some questions in. Okay, 10 minutes. Do we have a microphone for them? You hear me? Yes. Yeah, fine. I'm uh, Alex. Hello. The one who presented T. I saw. <laughs> cool. So, uh, the question is how do we feel about uh, dropping APC in favor of Opcache? As I know, it was uh, lots of time invested by you into making APC work for each PHP version. Right. So, basically, we had, there are four Opcaches, sometimes five, depending on how you count, different implementations of an opcode cache for PHP. And somebody had to give up their baby, basically, right? I mean, and I figured by setting an example and saying, look, we need an opcode cache in PHP. It really doesn't have to be mine. Um, and it's not just mine. There were other people working on it, right? But we need one in here. We need to get rid of this mess where we're always, we release a new version of PHP, and then it takes opcode caches six months to catch up. That just wasn't a useful situation. So we needed to get everybody on board. And politically, it was preferential if I gave up APC in order to, to push another one. And then we discussed a little bit amongst ourselves. I talked to Zend and said, look, there's going to be an opcode cache in the next version of PHP. So you guys have a closed source opcode cache. Do you want that to be part of the decision here? Do we, we're going to choose one. And you need to open source it if you want it to be considered. Because once there's an opcode cache in PHP by default, a closed source opcode cache is kind of stranded. Who's going to do all the work to replace a bundled opcode cache with another opcode cache? So they said, yeah, it, it makes sense. It probably should be in there. So they open sourced it. We looked at the code. We looked at the performance. And opcache is a little bit faster than APC. It uses more memory. Um, so there's a trade-off there. It doesn't do as much work to try to reclaim memory as APC did. Um, so that's the trade-off. You, you're going to need a little bit more shared memory for opcache, um, but you also get like 5% extra performance out of it. Um, so that's really the answer. Is I, I felt it politically necessary, and I think opcache is better code. It's simpler code, which means there are less problems. There are quite a few problems in, op, in APC because of the way the memory manager was written, and it was just really hard to maintain. And honestly, I'm quite happy that it's not my problem anymore, because <laughs> I'm no longer the main developer on, on the opcode cache. It's now Dimitri and, and a couple of other guys. When there's something really tricky, it's them that's on the spot. It's not me, and that takes some of the stress off of me, which I like. Thanks. 
Rasmus. Yes. Uh, welcome to Ukraine, and uh, thank you. I just want to say huge thank you. <laughs> you create a very powerful and great uh, language for programming. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. That's another question. <laughs> Give me some hard questions, please. Go. Um, hello, Rasmus. Um, one question regarding the uh, how PHP can handle uh, very e-commercial projects and uh, where how know-how is a key value. So PHP is open source, mm -hmm. open code, and sometimes when I think about how can I use it in a production, there is a kind of feeling that somebody can hack the uh, hosting environment and he will steal my know-how. Will be there anything kind of compile in a... Um, no. Well, uh, the short answer is way, no. Uh, the short answer is no. I mean, you no, 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 no. That's never gonna be there. It's never gonna be in PHP. If I mean, if you don't want them to steal your code, don't give them your code. If you're if you're running something commercially, right? I mean, just don't let people see your source code. If you're trying to sell software, licenses, right? And any sort of copy protection. The send one as well. The encryption thing was very, very easy to break. I don't want to get in that game. That's a, that's a no-win game, right? Anything we do, somebody can break it, right? There's no perfect, look at all the pirated video games out there. Anything that's out there can be hacked, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, hello, Rasmus. Hello, Hi. everyone. Uh, our uh, theme is uh, framework days. Yes. Uh, can you tell us your opinion about Framework, thank you. They all suck. <laughs> but, so, while they all suck, everyone needs a framework. What everyone doesn't need is a general purpose framework. Nobody has a general problem. Everyone has a very specific problem they're trying to solve. And a general purpose framework, while it can solve it, it usually solves it in a way that you get so many other things that you don't need that ends up being done on every request. There are frameworks that check to see which database you're using. So you have a request, hey, which database are we using? MySQL, okay, let's load the MySQL class that loads up this thing, that loads up this thing, that initializes the ORM and tells it to use this database. Two milliseconds later, the next request comes in, hey, which database are we using? Still MySQL, right? And on every request, we're asking all these questions, there's always hooks, and all these things, dynamic decisions that need to be made on every single request, that does not change from one request to the next. If you haven't hooked this particular hook in the API, you haven't hooked it two milliseconds later or two milliseconds after that. So usually what happens when a big company, when a company grows and they start it with a general purpose framework, they start optimizing things by ripping stuff out and they just tear the framework apart to the point where they could never upgrade. So if there's a new version of the framework, it doesn't really matter because they've modified the damn framework so much that they're stuck on the version they're on. And I think that's a huge problem. So I, would, I wish that the framework guys would have some way of doing a production push where you f configure, look, I'm using the auth module, I'm using MySQL always, I'm using this particular thing and this particular thing and nothing else. And then the framework should have some kind of push this and only push the components that you need to the production servers. So none of these other runtime decisions ever get made. Of course, you can go back and, and change things and say, now I want to use this hook. And fine, then you push that code to the production servers. But the dev environment and the production environment shouldn't be the same thing in this case because it's a scripting language. This, there's a lot of things that happen at runtime that shouldn't be happening at runtime in, in a case like that. So. That's one thing I see a lot, is people taking a general purpose framework and stripping it down. The other thing I see are people starting with no framework and then adding pieces of modular frameworks, just pulling out one piece of a framework and using that, and pulling out another piece of another framework maybe and using that. But there are many frameworks where you pull one piece out and the whole thing goes <laughs> right? <laughs> there are some frameworks that are okay, that, that are modular enough that you can pull things out, but many frameworks are so interconnected that it just doesn't work. Um, usually, I, I tell people to look for a targeted framework. 
So if you have a problem that looks a lot like a blogging problem, maybe WordPress should be a framework, <laughs> right? It's not a great framework, but if it's something, if, you're doing, if your problem is very close to something WordPress can handle, chances are you'll be using most of WordPress. There won't be all these other general purpose things that you won't touch. And that way you have a better targeted framework and you'll be able to upgrade as WordPress upgrades. Or you might be using something like Drupal. So if it's a more content management that fits more in the Drupal side of the house, then maybe Drupal is a better framework for you because it is more targeted than a general purpose framework. All right, that was a long answer to a simple question. <laughs> Hello, Rasmus. Yep. Uh, t t t tell me, please, uh, does uh, PHP has some uh, concrete goals for next improvements, for next development? Something like multi-byte uh, native support has been introduced as a goal for PHP 6? We, we, we don't have, we don't really have a list of goals for PHP 6 yet. We're, we're working on PHP 5.6 right now. Um, we're working on a list of features for that. Looking further out, I mean, we tried PHP 6. We tried PHP 6 against ICU, and basically adding a little bit of PHP to ICU was what we ended up doing, because ICU is huge, much bigger than PHP. And that's part of the problem. Things got so complicated when we tried turning all of PHP, um, all of the core of PHP, making that Unicode. Oh, no, no, I, I, I know the the reason why PHP 6 has okay. been developed. I mean, are there some, uh, the same science goals very huge in the next, uh, next version? Not, not that ambitious. Ah. Because, because we, th we ended up discovering that we had this huge ambitious goal and it was too much of a leap. So we went from here to way over here in one revision, basically, and a whole bunch of developers in between saying, whoa, this is too much. This is too many changes. This is too much work for me to migrate my extension. And we lost a lot of developers, which is why I had to cancel PHP 6 and say, OK, this is too much. Let's take small hops. So we go small hop, small hop, small hop, small hop. We might eventually get there, but we need to take smaller steps so that the developers don't get overwhelmed. They see, okay, one or two changes, that's fine, I can handle that. Rewriting my entire extension, no way, I'm just gonna stay on PHP 5. So I'm a little fearful of having these long-reaching goals. I mean, I do have some that things I want to see PHP do, but I don't really want to distract everybody and say, look, we're gonna work on this now because I want us to get there in, in smaller hops. Um, so some, some longer reaching goals is obviously Unicode. I'm waiting for a really good UTF-8 based library that the whole world standardizes on that's not ICU, because ICU is too big and too heavy. Um, I'm very interested in the JIT work that's going on both at Google and at Facebook. So a future version, not PHP 6, maybe PHP 7, um, will, might be based on a JIT, um, whatever JIT is fastest by, by then. Um, but other than those two things, Unicode and, and JIT, those are sort of huge, huge things. I don't have any others that I'm really sort of thinking too hard about. Yeah, it's clear. Thank you. Hi there. Um, I had a thought to ask you what your favorite framework is, but that's clearly a waste of time. Yes. Um, why did you make us wear out our dollar key? <laughs> so why dollar signs? Um, honestly, because... I was doing a lot, I mean, I saw PHP as doing a whole bunch of string interpolation, right? So putting variables inside strings. And when you do that, you have to have some kind of delimiter. Either you have to put something in front and behind, or you have to just put a single character in front, basically. So that was you. <laughs> now you killed my mic. Oh, it's back. Okay. So the dollar sign basically, I, I had to choose. You either put something in front of behind and then, I mean, some languages have delimiters inside a string and then variables look different outside of a string. I wanted it to look the same, basically. I wanted the variable to look like a variable, whether it was inter in, interpolated inside the string or whether it was outside the string. Plus, honestly, it also made the parser a little bit easier to write. So 
I could I would always know simply by the fact that there's a dollar sign there this is a string I didn't have to worry about whether this might be a function call or a string and it also means that you can have variables the same name as functions for example right if you if you didn't have the dollar sign then you wouldn't be able to do that quite as easily or at least the parser would have to work a hell of a lot harder trying to figure out if something called while is actually a while loop or if it's a variable called while right so a lot of this was implementation wise it was just easier plus i was writing a lot of perl at the time yeah hi rasmus and welcome to Sorry. ukraine uh, uh, okay do you have a short question Only yeah short question. as usual uh, so my question is about unblocking applications and uh, there is a great article uh, with name PHP is mean to die and uh, <laughs> there are trying uh, to write unlocking application with PHP for instance uh, it's Re react PHP and uh, PHP daemon and uh, what your opinion about uh, this approach as creator of PHP? Right. Ha uh, should I use a PHP for unblocking applications or should I use some kind of different tools, for instance, Node.js? Well, I, I think you can use PHP. I mean, Node is a completely different way of, of solving that problem, right? It, when you're writing a Node application, you have to think about the problem very, very differently. Um, you can use that same approach with PHP. PHP's lib event extension is really, really interesting. And you can write something that looks a lot like Node. If you go, there's a nodephp.org, I think, this is a site that basically implements Node in PHP using lib event. Um, lib event plus 0MQ and PHP. And you can write some really, really interesting event driven PHP applications. Um, whether you should or not, I don't know, it depends how much existing code you already have in PHP. If you're starting from nothing, if you don't know any language, I would probably use Go, to be honest, for something like that. I wouldn't use Node. Um, but if you, if you have existing PHP code that you need to integrate with, yeah, I would write it in PHP. So sh short uh, answer is yes, I, sh I can use PHP. Yeah, if you're a PHP shop, you know PHP, definitely I would use PHP for that. Thank you. You're welcome.